go. Hello and welcome to this Bible study. Today we are going through Exodus 14. We have a few verses in 13 to hit on uh, before we're going to cover all of 14. And I also want to add in now, just from a, a logistic standpoint, as far as those that are watching in time, we are going to do uh, Exodus 15 next week, and then we're going to take the rest of December off, and then I'll be picking it up in January. I don't know if I'll do the first Wednesday or the second Wednesday in January with uh, Egypt um, and the Desert Wanderings. We'll be picking it up in Exodus chapter 16 in January. So why don't you uh, bow your heads, and let's dedicate this time to God. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you uh, that you lead us, Lord, that you are our pillar that we can follow, that you've given us your word as a guide to light our path of where we should go and what we should do as a resource for us to know who you are and what you want from us. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you will speak through me. I pray that you will open the ears and the hearts and the minds of those people that are listening and watching right now. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, this one will not be as long as the last two in talking about the Passover, um, but today we are going to see the parting of the Red Sea. We're going to see the Israelites leaving Egypt uh, and going off into the desert and Pharaoh pursuing them and then them crossing the Red Sea. Exciting stuff. So we're going to do this in, uh, I think, three chunks is the uh, layout today. We have uh, Exodus 13, verse 17 through the end of 13, which is verse 22. Then uh, chapter 14, verse 1 uh, through verse 14. And then the third chunk is the parting of the Red Sea, which is Exodus 14, verse 15 through the end of 14, which is verse 31. So why don't you uh, grab your Bibles and join me. 13, 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the sea, toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones with you from this place. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Awesome stuff. So um, the first thing to discuss is the road through the Philistine country. So the Philistines um, are a very well-known people in the Old Testament. Um, we see them in Judges, in 1 Samuel. Uh, we see them interactions with, uh, interact with uh, Samson, uh, Samuel, King Saul, as well as King David. And a very famous um, character that you no doubt colored in Sunday school was a Philistine. Goliath. Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine. So the Philistines were a very strong military force that existed in Canaan. They were believed to be a sea people that came from uh, Crete as well as uh, the islands uh, and even eastern Greece from that area. And they came and settled in what is today Gaza uh, or similar areas right around there. Um, and so what you see here is, uh, and actually I'm going to pull up um, and do what we did last time and use good old Google Earth, but um, I found out there's a really cool way to be able to screen record using my iPad, so we're going to do that. So uh, three, two, one, we're live on the Google Earth. There we go. Okay, so there we are, and let's spin around. Uh, Tyler is filming this, and unfortunately he doesn't get to see what I'm doing here. Sorry, Tyler. So uh, there you have Egypt. You have the Nile Delta, Nile Delta, that's there. And as we talked about last time, let's see if the city name pops up here. Uh, it should, as it comes in. Yes, 
uh, Ismailia is the town, uh, let me get my mouse right here, there we go. And about, if we zoom out just a little bit, um, Ramesses was the town that they traveled from last time. So they roughly traveled from um, here down to the edge of the, um, the edge of Egypt. For those that are listening, I apologize. I'll try to give description. Um, but they, Goshen was the region, as we talked about last week, that was given to the Israelites back when Joseph and his brothers came into Egypt and were welcomed and, and invited into Egypt. They were given the eastern side of the Nile, Nile Basin, uh, and that's Goshen. So last week we talked about them leaving there and going um, to a town that was near present-day um, Ismailia. But then now what we have happen is, as you zoom out here, um, you see Jerusalem, right? So Jerusalem now, this is the border of Jerusalem. It's like a dagger uh, here with a sharp edge. And then this is all Egypt. So they are traveling from uh, the, the fertile area of the Nile Basin, and they're going to the Promised Land. The Promised Land is Canaan, up here where it says Jerusalem. And this is where they're traveling too. But what God says here is that he does not want to lead them on the road through Philistine country. Philistine country is southwest Jerusalem right in here. And God does not want Israel at this point to face the Philistines. Now, if God wanted to intervene and overpower them, he could, but God has a plan in place. So the question is, uh, what route did they take? There are three ways that they could go in traveling. Uh, there is the way that's called the Via Maris, which is called the Way of the Sea, which is the way going up north here. It's the most logical, it's the shortest route. Via Maris, or the, the Way of the Sea, is the way that God does not want to take them because they would be going through that Philistine country. Another route that they could go is a little bit further south and going um, not basically going diagonal through uh, the Sinai Peninsula. And the third way is going down all the way down um, along the edge of the Red Sea, which is the route that is believed that they took. So the Philistines, this is an interesting thing. So I want to give you a little bit of history on this uh, that I dug up. Um, I am not a uh, historical, uh, I'm not a historian. This is just what I read. Uh, in talking about the Philistines. The name uh, Philistine is Hebrew. Uh, Palestia is the Greek name, which is where we get the rendering of Palestine. Now, the Israelites did battle with the Philistines. As you remember, uh, Samson, uh, the Philistines are upon you. Uh, and then David battled with Goliath. So a few spots where you can read about Israel uh, battling with the Philistines. Judges 13.1, Judges 14.1, uh, 1 Samuel 4.1, 1 Samuel 13.4, and then 1 Samuel 17.23 introduces uh, uh, David and Goliath. Those are just four spots, or five, um, that have the Philistines in them. But an interesting element, the Philistines historically were annihilated by the Jews. They were under first Saul and then David overpowered and defeated the Philistines. The people that remained then um, were brought into Canaanite culture and dissolved into Canaanite culture and they ceased to be a people group. Emperor Hadrian was the Roman emperor from uh, 117 AD to 138 AD. He changed the name of Israel in that region to Palestine. He also changed the name of Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina. I read one thing that said that he did this because of his hatred for the Jews. And in Jewish history, the Philistines were their greatest enemy. So he changed the name of the entire region to Palestine and, and wanting to annihilate the Jews, changed the name of Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina. It's one of the things that I've read. Now, the controversy that exists today, the Philistines... Uh, Palestine, the Palestinians, there is one side that says that the Palestinians that exist now in Gaza and the conflict that's happening now aren't actually Palestinians, that they are actually Jordanians. But there is no question that, that, that 
in, when you look at that conflict, there are people who lived in Gaza that when Israel came in in 1948, um, some got displaced, some went and, and left and went to Aryan countries. Um, and there, is a, a, there are different sides. I am not a historian. I am not um, versed in these elements. But uh, what the Bible does say is that the Philistines were destroyed by Saul as well as King David. Just something interesting to think about that that's still uh, a tension that exists today. So as we look at this, The question is, why did God not take them in the shortest route? And God clearly says that he does not want them, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. And we're going to see that. You see this in Numbers. Uh, It's, I believe that it's Exodus, excuse me, uh, Numbers 14. I could be wrong on that, but I believe it's Numbers 14, where you see uh, Moses and Aaron trying to plead with the people uh, to cross over into the promised land, but the people are afraid and they don't trust in God. And as a result of that, God says, okay, you don't believe me. You don't trust me. None of you who are alive in Egypt and joined in the Exodus will ever see the promised land. And that led to it taking 40 years of wandering in the desert before uh, they were able to take the promised land. God says, and again, I believe it's um, Numbers 14. I'll put the, the, the verse up. God says that no one under 20, uh, no one over 20 will be able to cross over into um, the promised land because they, they didn't believe. God knew what they were going to do. God also had a plan in place. And we're going to see this um, as we're going to talk about uh, God wanting to glorify himself. We're going to hit on that. Uh, before the end. But God still has a role for Pharaoh in this, and he still wants to do amazing, mighty work that will bring glory to himself. Uh, And so God has a plan in place. And so he leads Israel in kind of a a wandering sort of way that we're going to see that causes Pharaoh to say, okay, they have no idea what they're doing. They're weak. We can bring them back. And we're going to see that in a second. And Pharaoh is going to pursue them. Um, A few Bible passages here. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Now the King James, the new King James version is, is even more appropriate for our study today. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Imagine from their perspective Why are we wandering around? Why can't we just go the direct route? So many times in life, we think we're we're off our plan. It's like we're supposed to be going this direction for, for whatever reason, hardship faces, doors are closed, and for whatever reason, we have to go another direction, and we get bitter and we get upset. But it very well might be that God has a plan in place. Joseph being sold as a slave into Egypt, God had a plan that to use Joseph through his hardship to save Israel and bring them down into Egypt. And then uh, the Bible talks about um, refining them in the fire and growing them as a people group into a mighty nation. And we've discussed this. There's between 2 and 2.5 million people that partake in the Exodus. God had a plan in place. God has a plan in place for your life if you will trust him in that. There are times at which there's hardship. You might have caused that own hardship on yourself and you might have to deal with that, but it very well might be that God has a plan in place for you. Pray about it. Ask him to give you uh, insight, to give you explanation. Sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes we're just meant to trust him and follow him. Uh, Wearsby is one of the commentaries that I enjoy. And he said in related to this, we may not always understand the way he chooses or even agree with it, but his way is always the right way. Okay, we're only a few verses in. I got to keep going. Joseph's bones. Uh, Verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. Those of you who have been with us for a while, you know that at the very end of Genesis, Joseph gives an interesting instructions to, um, to the Israelites. So flip with me to Genesis 50. Flip with me to Genesis 50 right at the very end of the book. Genesis 50, 
verse 22, Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all of his father's family. He lived 110 years and he saw the third generation of Ephraim's children. Also the children of Machir, son of Manasseh, were placed at birth on Joseph's knees. This is right at the very end of his life. Verse 24, then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Joseph is referencing back to the promise God made in Genesis 15 to Abram. He's referencing to this. You are going to be in a land that is not your own. You're going to be there for 400 years, but I will remember you and I will take you up out of there. That's what he's referencing here. And Joseph knows that God has made that promise to Abraham. And Joseph knows that you are going to be in Egypt for a period of time, but God will remember you and take you out of there. God will take you out. This is a promise that was given to Israel. Verse 25, And Joseph made the Israelites swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. Verse 26, So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. This now is the fulfillment of that. Verse 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. It's almost word for word from Genesis 50 uh, from quoting what Joseph had said. And you actually, if you want to, you can read um, Joshua 24, 32 is Joshua actually burying Joseph's bones uh, in Canaan, in the promised land. Okay, continuing on, um, let's actually look at the pillar of cloud and fire, okay? I'm going to skip ahead, so I'll be reading a little bit of what we're going to read again, and it'll be, um, we'll be over it twice, and that's okay. But we have several times in 13 and 14 that this pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night is mentioned. Verse 21, by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. Chapter 14, verse 19, then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel throughout the night. The cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Then skipping down to verse 24, During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. This is a um, angel of God we have on verse 19 who is... Um, in this pillar of cloud and fire, uh, it is a guiding light. I can't imagine what this must have been like to have this column of cloud, which provided them um, shade from the bright sun, but later on we're going to see it actually divides them and prevents the Egyptian army from finding them. It provides light for Israel and darkness for Egypt. Imagine what it would have been like. In the future, we're actually going to see God speaking through the cloud. Uh, Exodus 33, 9 through 10. Numbers 12, 5 through 6. Deuteronomy 31, 15 through 16. And Psalm 99, verse 7 are all instances of God speaking from this cloud. It stays with... Um, Verse 22 of 13, Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. This will continue to be a guiding element and God's present with the Israelites. Uh, let's actually flip to the very end of Exodus. We just read the very end of um, Genesis. Let's do the last few verses of Exodus, picking it up on uh, Exodus 40, verse 34. Exodus 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. 
but if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. That's the close, the last little paragraph of the book of Exodus. God used the cloud to guide the Israelites. They would stay if the cloud was staying, but if the cloud moved in front of them, they would pick up all their tents, their, all their camps, everything, and they would follow the cloud until it stopped. It guided them. Israel as a nation, as we study Exodus, we are going to see God directly intervene and interact with his people. And as I read that, there's part of me that is just, I long for Moses' interaction with God. Moses spoke to God. And the same way, the Israelites seeing these amazing things, seeing uh, the, the plagues, the mighty things happen in Egypt, seeing what we're going to discuss in a second of the parting of the Red Sea, seeing all these elements. But we are going to realize as we look at Israel as a nation, um, no one ever believes because of the miracles. And though you see miracles, doubt quickly follows. And despite seeing these amazing things happen, Israel still is going to doubt, and we're going to see this as we continue on. But application, we do have today a pillar to guide us, a pillar to guide us by day, a pillar to guide us by night. It is our Bibles. God has given us this word as a guide for us. Israel did not have this in Moses' day, but we do, and it does give us instruction I love the acronym Bible, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Explains it perfectly. Use this as a pillar in your life to guide you by day or by night, when you're on the top of the mountain or when you're in the valley. This is your resource to use. Continuing on, we are going to read the first 14 verses of chapter 14. Verse four, chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Haharoth between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue me, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Verse 5, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of his best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pi Harath, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out into the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Verse 12, Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Verse 13, Moses's, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Phenomenal passages. Awesome stuff. So let's go through this. So, uh, the land. I'm going to pull back up. Oh, we're still recording. <laughs> we're still recording on my uh, screen capture here. 
well, it makes for one video easier to sync. Uh, hopefully it's not too huge. Um, so as we look for the route that he's going, basically what's happening is, is that they are, um, come on, there we go. Uh, it refreshed. They're wandering back and forth through this area in here. And Moses um, is following God's decree and, and call for where to lead the people, but it's not a uh, clean, clear path. And Pharaoh sees it and he sees it as a weakness and he pursues after them. Now the question is, where is the parting of the Red Sea? And we're going to talk about that in a second. I'm going to stop the screen recording just so that this video clip isn't so huge. Um, and we'll come back here to my notes. I will gain, gain glory. We see this um, in verse 4. And, you know, when I see this, when I read through this, um, as we've been going through the plagues, God says that he hardens Pharaoh's heart to bring glory to himself. And I got to admit, when I see that, it, it just, it, it's like this, it's like, uh, we are not supposed to glorify ourselves. That's something that we as Christians aren't supposed to do. We're not supposed to be prideful and show how awesome we are. But God clearly says, I will gain glory for myself. And there's a reason for it and a reason why it is an awesome thing. But I'm going to hold you on the edge of that because we're going to see that as we continue on. Um, we're going to see it in verse 17, and then we're going to see the answer and the conclusion to this in the final passage of chapter 14. So hang with me on that one, and we'll answer it as we come back around. Now the chariots, uh, verse 7 of Exodus 14, 600 chariots were his greatest chariots, um, but he also brought along with them all the other chariots of Egypt with his officers over all of them. Chariots in that day are the equivalent of the top of the line tank would be like that today. In that day, the chariot was the most uh, powerful military weapon you could possibly have. It's the idea um, I actually watched, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but Ben-Hur, 1959 Ben-Hur, not the new one, I haven't seen the new one, it, I mean the remake, but from 1959 with Charlton Heston, uh, Phenomenal movie. It is awesome. For 1959, the graphics are amazing. And it was the most expensive movie ever made at the time. Uh, won all kinds of awards. But phenomenal movie also as a Christian. I highly recommend watching it. It gives the perspective of Judah Ben-Hur, who is a very wealthy Jew living in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. But it does have uh, some epic battle scenes, so to speak, of the uh, chariot races in the Oval. And, I mean, it's just amazing scenes to watch and to see. But you realize how powerful these chariots were. So keep that in mind, that this is the most powerful army on the face of the planet at the time, using the latest technology at the time to pursue after uh, the Israelites. It might not seem like a chariot might not seem like that big of a deal. The equivalent would be um, if you were to look at a bow and arrow for that matter. What is a bow and arrow against a rifle? It's nothing. But if you have the bow and arrow and your opponents have hatchets, then a bow and arrow is amazing, an amazing weapon. So at any rate, Pharaoh and all the Egyptians are chasing down the Israelites to annihilate and bring back whatever survivors they can. That is their goal. And you see what Israel says here. Why have you brought us out to the desert to die? It would have been better for us to stay slaves in Egypt than to die out here. What have you done? And Moses' response, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Be still and know that I am God. That's another phenomenal application for us. Um, trusting in God to know that no matter what you're going through, God works for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. Doesn't mean that God is going to make everything good. It means that 
it's good from his point of view. It might not be that he gives you everything that you want. It very well could be that whatever trial you're going through, you're going through for a reason, like we talked about with Joseph being sold as a slave because God had a plan for him. But it might also be that you're going through a hardship because of the, you, you, you got to live with your mistakes. You, you, mu- you will reap what you sow. So it might be that you're being taught a lesson so that you don't make that same mistake again. But trust in God. Be still and know that He is God. Another great story that jumps out to me when I look at this um, is the story of Elisha. Uh, let's flip there, actually. 2 Kings, 2 Kings uh, 6.15. Second uh, Kings 6, verse 15. So the story here is that um, Elisha is completely surrounded and his servant is terrified. Uh, verse 15, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. The servant's terrified. And he says to Elisha, we are surrounded. We are going to die. What are we going to do? This is what Elisha says. Don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Imagine what the servant thought when he heard that. What do you mean those that are with us? We're surrounded and totally outnumbered. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Read the rest of the chapter to read what happens. But it's an amazing story of God coming in miraculously uh, and being victorious. It's an awesome story. So the application there, trust God. Okay, now let's read the rest of 14, verse 15 through uh, the end of chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all the night the the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. Verse 23, The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw them into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord said, saved, excuse me. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians laying dead on the shore. Verse 31. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. 
So the first thing that I want to hit on, and I might be going out of order here, is this last line, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. That's the answer. Why does God seek glory for himself? Uh, verse um, 17, I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army. And then going back to verse uh, four, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. So when you look at this, what is the result? What happens when God gains glory? When God alone is glorified, what happens? People are saved. People see the mighty work that God does. They give credit to God. They fear him in a healthy and reverent way. They acknowledge who he is as our creator, as, as the mighty hand of God, and as our redeemer. And they believe. And another important thing that's said, they put their trust in him. They put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Throughout the Bible, when God is glorified, when man is glorified and man gets the credit, man's going to screw that up. It's a guarantee that any human being that you put your trust in is going to let you down. It's a guarantee. We are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. So if you are following someone and you are giving them the glory, be warned, they're going to let you down. But when God gets the glory, people are saved. Lives are changed and people are saved. That is why God puts us in situations that only God can get credit for it. When you look at Gideon, the story of Gideon, where he uh, was facing the Midianites and he had a massive force that was going against him and he looked at his military that was a, a decent number but not enough and God said, yeah, you got too many. And Gideon's like, what? I have too many? Yeah, you have too many. Do this. Cut them down in half. Half of them left. And God says again, you still have too many. And he did something else to, uh, where they go up and they drink the water. And those that stick their heads in versus those that cup the water. He filtered them down to a small, small number so that when Israel beat them and won the day, there's no way that Gideon and his army could have credit. God alone could be glorified. And why? Because when God alone is glorified and not man, then people are saved. That's the reason why it's so significant and so important and why God is seeking glory. Sorry for that, that long ta tangent. The parting of the Red Sea. Let's talk about the parting of the Red Sea. So where did this happen? Where did the parting of the Red Sea happen? Okay, we're going to go back to Google Earth, and I'm going to turn back on my screen recording. Three, two, one, and there we go. We got our screen recording. Okay, so this is the Sinai Peninsula. We have Egypt uh, on the west. You have Israel on the right. Now, there are three potential locations that um, biblical scholars, biblical archaeologists um, believe could be potential locations for where uh, the parting of the Red Sea could have happened. And in fact, um, I want to pull up an article this is a resource, Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology, and this is an um, article that is titled, Where Did the Red Sea Crossing Take Place? And this is, um, look at that photo. I apologize for those people who are listening to this. Um, this is a satellite image of the Sinai Peninsula, and you have up here where all the, the clouds are over is the Nile uh, Basin, the Nile River Delta. Um, then you have the Suez Canal is in the clouds right here. Uh, then you have uh, the Gulf of Suez on right here and then the Gulf of Aqaba. So there are three potential locations where people think, uh, scholars, etc., cetera, um, say the parting of the Red Sea happened. The first one is actually not the Red Sea, but the Sea of Reeds. And when you look at the Hebrew for Red Sea, it could actually be interpreted as Sea of Reeds. Um, and one of the um, environmental, uh, um, what's the word, I'm, the natural 
argument. You remember how we've been talking about the naturalist arguments as we've been going through the plagues? And the naturalistic point of view is saying that everything that happened um, was just a natural event. Um, and that those that believe say that God was using uh, Mother Nature for his purposes. And those that don't believe in the miracles simply say that the uh, Israelites were superstitious and it was just a series of bad things that happened that they attributed to be plagues. So the first of the three, parting of the Red Sea, the argument is, is that they didn't, it wasn't some miraculous parting of the Red Sea. It was north of the Gulf of Suez, uh, where present day Suez Canal is. And it was a shallow area that fluctuated with the tides. And it was a sea of reeds. And what happened was, is that um, they timed it right so that they went through at low tide uh, and it might have been a very windy day where the it dried out the area and by the time they got to the other side the tide had risen and killed all of the egyptians but the israelites um, got through safely and as i look back in my notes here um, verse 21 of chapter 14 if you read just verse 21 on its own you can actually justify this argument. You can't read anything around it, but just verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. Boom. If you just read that out of context, you could make the argument that uh, it was a sea of reeds and that it was just a natural thing that occurred. But you can't read anything around it. Uh, at all. You can't read uh, the, the following verse, uh, verse 22, the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And again, verse 29, but the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. <clears throat> so there's two, there's two other potential locations and both of them see this as a miraculous occurrence that is God stepping in, intervening, and parting the Red Sea so that they could walk through on dry ground with a gigantic wall on either side. If you've seen uh, The Prince of Egypt, which is done by, I think it's DreamWorks, uh, it's a great animated series that came out, or uh, animated movie. I love it. I love it. But it paints the picture and boom, the water spread. Same thing. Charlton Heston again is in the Ten Commandments and you see the same thing. The parting of the Red Sea, this miraculous thing. Uh, so on that note, I'll talk about the two locations where it could be, but I want to talk about the wall of water. Um, God's greatness was shown through it. That's the most important thing. As we were talking about before, God is seeking glory to save his people, the Israelites, to bring them into uh, a loving relationship, but a trusting relationship in him, which is why he's doing this. Um, for more, you can actually read Joshua 2.10, Nehemiah 9.9, 9, Psalm 136, verse 13 through 14, as well as Psalm 106, verse 9 through 12, which I'm going to read right now. He rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe, from the hand of the enemy. He redeemed them. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them survived. Then they believed his promises and sang his praise. Let's actually flip um, to next week. We're going to look at Exodus 15, but I want to just skip ahead just a little bit and read verse 4 through 8 of 15. This is uh, what's called the Song of Moses. This is a song that Moses writes to glorify God. And verse four, he says, Pharaoh's chariots and his army, he is hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone, to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. Continue on, verse seven. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those opposing you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The surging waters stood up like a wall. The deep waters congealed into the heart of the sea. That's not uh, a tide shifting. That's not wading through waist deep water. Uh, no, this is, this is an amazing, miraculous event that happened. And that's the point. Um,
Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created. If you can't get past that, you're not going to believe this. And you're not going to believe a lot of the Bible. But if you believe that, that God created the earth, then why can't this happen? Why isn't it possible that God could do something like this? It is a miraculous thing that he did. Um, Exodus 14, 30 through 31 is the reason why he did this. Why? Why did he part the Red Sea? When the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. So location, let's come back here to Google Earth. Um, so you have the Gulf of Suez, you have the Gulf of Aqaba. So <clears throat> that first theory crossing at the Sea of the Reeds, um, it's somewhere up in the north here, and that's not biblical. Um, one option is the Gulf of Suez, somewhere in the northern section up here, um, where it still is a mighty section that they crossed. Uh, it's likely not midway down the Gulf of Suez or further down, but somewhere up in the northern third of the Gulf of Suez. There's another theory that actually um, the Gulf of Aqaba, which is on the other side of the Sinai Peninsula, which is also the Red Sea, that that was the section that was, was parted. It was actually the Gulf of Aqaba. Um, and why do they believe that? Well, if you go back to Exodus 3, this is where Moses... Um, flees Egypt, crosses the desert, and ends up in Midian. Well, where is Midian? Midian is on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba. So uh, when we look at Moses um, uh, interacting with the burning bush, the mountain of Moses, all those elements, there is a possibility that it's in this mountain range that's on the east side of the Gulf of Aqaba. Now, most people believe that the Mount of Moses, um, Mount Sinai, is where we discussed before, right in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula, which gives the argument for the Suez Gulf being what they crossed for the parting of the Red Sea, and that being the location where Moses is going to bring down the Ten Commandments from God. But there is an argument out there um, that supports the Gulf of Aqaba. I don't know. I am not a biblical archaeologist, but this article um, that I'll put a link to on Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology does paint a picture of the different perspectives um, of its potential of the Gulf of Aqaba being the location where they parted. Um, and as we look at this graphic, uh, you can see the, the, what it would mean, what it would entail. The blue line would be if it was a crossing of the Gulf of Aqaba, which would mean in Exodus 14, in this time, they traveled across the Sinai Peninsula pursued by Egypt to get there. The red line here um, would be if they did the uh, Gulf of Suez is where they crossed on the northern section, which I think um, is the, more, um, the, the stronger argument and going with uh, Mount Sinai, um, Mount of Moses, as we've discussed before, in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. But I don't know. It's a very interesting argument um, that this article makes and backs it up with uh, archaeological evidence. There's also a video um, on here that is referenced that looks like a great uh, video um, that is a professionally produced movie that gives the different perspectives on where the parting of the Red Sea actually happened. I do want to say this. I didn't do background research on Armstrong Institute of Biblical Archaeology. I do not know um, their fundamental beliefs. All I did was read through the majority of this article, and it does paint uh, a compelling argument that there could potentially have been one of these two locations. Uh, it's something to look up. And for those that are listening, um, I put the link in your description notes uh, below. Same thing with, with YouTube. So that's it for... Uh, Exodus 14. Uh, God has parted the Red Sea. He has brought the Israelites out of bondage. He has destroyed the Egyptian army. He has fulfilled the prophecy of Genesis 15, where God said to Abram that I will, you will, 
surely be in a land that is not your own for 400 years, but I will remember you, I will bring you out, I will bring you out with great wealth, and I will punish those people that um, persecuted you. And that is what we have seen fulfilled. Next week, we are going to read, uh, it's going to be a short week uh, next week because we're, we're just going to be going through this poem uh, of chapter 15. There is some elements from 19 through 27 um, that are outside the, the song of Moses, uh, but read ahead, read ahead. Um, that's it for this week, and that's also pretty much it for um, the captivity in Egypt. We're going to continue on. Uh, to the second half of Exodus, where we're going to be looking at uh, the desert wanderings, uh, the, the, that time of 40 years that the Israelites are going to spend wandering in the desert. Um, so I'm excited to get to that half. I'm excited for next week as we look at this beautiful song that Moses writes um, to glorify God. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have given us your pillar that we can follow by day and by night. This uh, pillar of fire that you have given us that gives us your love. It shows your love. It shows your redemption for us. I pray that we will um, put it to memory and use it as a, a resource to light our path, to guide us in both the day and the night. I pray that those that are listening now, Lord, will, will renew their faith in you and their faith in your word as the pillar in their life to guide them. Thank you, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys next week as we continue on to Exodus 15.